back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escow. As the election nears, has Donald Trump really been aggressive in controlling drug prices, as he loves to say all the time? What about that card, that free giveaway card he was going to give to all Medicare recipients? And if we have time, what about Trump and Social Security. Joining me now is Alex Lawson. You probably know Alex if you're a regular viewer of this show. Alex is the executive director of Social Security Works. He also hosts a broadcast called Solidarity Live, and I'm probably missing three other things he does, but that's okay. Alex, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Richard. I uh, love being here. Well, I, we love having you. And uh, as you and I were um, about to do this, not long before, word came out about uh, this plan Trump had where he was going to send a card to uh, a lot of Medicare recipients, maybe not all of them, but most of them, and um, with, what, 200 bucks mm -hmm. worth of drug purchases on it. Uh, and what happened? The court struck it down? The court didn't strike it down. It's a little... Um I don't know, funnier, but it's 2020, so I don't know what humor is anymore. But uh, it's it's actually that the people who were in charge of it could recognize that it was illegal. Um, it's an illegal thing uh, that they were trying to do, and they were afraid of being prosecuted for these illegal things. This would obviously not be the first illegal thing uh, that the Trump administration had done. It's just now some of the underlings are a little bit unsure if their boss is going to be able to protect them uh, if they do something like steal $8 billion out of Medicare uh, and give it to the, the drug corporations so that seniors um, would have lower uh, drug costs going into the election, which I just want to state for the record, I want seniors to have lower drug costs. I want them to get a lot lower than just $200 off. Uh, but that's not what Donald Trump was doing here. He was fundamentally attacking the Medicare system uh, for another one of his, you know, uh, ridiculous smoke and mirrors non-plans. It was just a headline he was looking for. Uh, and he got some of it. I hope he gets challenged more now on his failure to lower drug prices, because that's the real story. Drug prices have gone up every single year of his presidency. You know, I think this whole drug card idea, uh, it, it's instructive to me in a lot of ways because first of all, yeah, I agree with you. Anything seniors are struggling in this country now, anything that can give them a break to $200 is not nothing as they say, but it's also not a lot when you consider the costs that seniors are facing anyway and the retirement crisis and all the other financial squeezes. And as you said, this doesn't lower drug costs. This is taking Medicare money and giving it to pharma. Pharma doesn't get the same amount, mm -hmm. right? They just get it from a different bank account. In this case, the one that's supposed to provide people with Medicare. Uh, but they're still overcharging and being overpaid. And at the end of the day, that's the real ripoff, right? Absolutely. Um, you can't actually lower, you can't solve the problem or materially help somebody unless you lower drug prices. That's the problem. Um, it, it, it's, it'd be like if I was paying, you know, $200 for a drug that I'm taking and I complain to you, and you were like, hey, good news. I went to your bank and I took $200 out of your <laughs> bank account. Uh, and I'm going to give that to you to pay for your your uh, prescriptions. And I'm like, that sounds like a bad deal for me because my prescriptions still cost $200. And the only thing that's happened is I don't have the $200 that was in the Medicare trust fund for me anymore. Um, and what would be really galling is if Richard you actually had the power to just lower my prescription drug prices, right? right? Because that's actually what we're getting at here. The government, when I complain to the government about the cost of my prescription, it's with the knowledge that the government can just lower the prices. Like literally with the, a signature, the president with executive action 
with signing a piece of paper could lower my drug prices. And if he really wanted to, I bet you I could make something that averaged out to $200 for every person in this country. Uh, you just have to, it'd be a really long math problem. Uh, I want to do a lot more than that, but I'm just saying it's literally within his power to lower drug prices and he's not doing it. Uh, and I just want to say, just because, you know, we know this and I think your listeners know this. The reason is because pharma is literally in charge of his, of HHS, of the Health and Human Services. Right. He put a guy who was one third of a cartel that raised the price of insulin until it's killing people. It's so high on a regular regular basis, Alex Azar, the pharma bro, he's in charge of our health care in this country. That's why Donald Trump hasn't lowered drug prices. Right. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that this is a cheap attempt to it's like they used to have these green stamps. I don't know if they used to have them, but you could overcharge as much as you want, but the merchant would then give you a little green stamp and make you feel like, yeah, you know, you got something back for it. You didn't get anything back for it. It's, uh, and that gets us obviously to the question of an Alex Azar, drug company executive. When people say farmer bro, like you did, everybody thinks of Martin Shkreli, who was a jerk. Granted, a yeah. horrific guy, but I would argue that Alex Azar has caused much more death and disease. Uh, Absolutely. On a bigger scale. Actually, so, actually, the only people who hate Shkreli more than we do are the actual pharma bros like Alex Azar because he blew up their spot. He was so abhorrent, and then he bought uh, the Wu-Tang album so that everyone hated him uh, that they got too much limelight. They were just steadily ripping us off and killing us. And, you know, they didn't rock the boat. It just slowly raised the temperature. Um, and mainly it was, you know, seniors, people with disabilities, um, people who Donald Trump definitely puts into the only category. It's only seniors who are dying from COVID. Um, it affects basically nobody except for seniors or those with pre-existing conditions, the onlys. Uh, that is who, you know, the pharma corporations preyed on and prey on, continue to prey on. They know that if they're going to hurt people, they have to hurt the least among us because that's the people who have the, 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 the um, those are the people who will not fight back because they are not empowered to fight back. Pharma knows that. That's the game. Uh, the sick game that's being played here. And, you know, Donald Trump is just, I don't know, he's a moron and corrupt and just complicit and all of that wrapped in a petulant child package. Uh, but there's one thing I know for sure. He's never going to lower drug prices. He can't lower drug prices because the sophisticated players in this town are Alex Azar. The sophisticated players are the ones who have designed policy that gives Donald Trump what he wants, which is the headlines, but will not actually drive down prices and therefore affect the bottom line of these corporations. You know, he uh, he showed that right from the start, uh, Alex Lawson, right? Because he appointed Azar. Uh, he appointed uh, Tom Price. He he's in book. Uh, appointed people consistently. He, you know, as you and I know, he was unusual for a Republican when he was running for the nomination and for president because he actually said he was going to do something about drug prices, which they don't typically even say. But then he immediately put the foxes in charge of the hen house, if that's the expression. And um, so we know that, but we also know it. Why? Because he's had four years and as you pointed out he has the legal ability to lower drug prices uh, certainly the moral case couldn't be clearer in most cases the the american people funded the development of, of, of these drugs there's people are overcharging and as a, pharma companies are overcharging people are dying uh, but he won't do it so, and, and since you mentioned that by the way just uh, you mind reminding us why he has the ability to do it with the stroke of a pen? Yeah, it, it's important to remember where all the power that pharma 
comes uh, has comes from all the power that they have comes from monopolies that are granted to them by the public by us by the taxpayers by the the u.s government we literally this is not an exaggeration we the taxpayers pay to develop the drugs our dollars so it's ours right like we make the food we prepare it we go to the grocery store we buy the groceries we make it we bake the whole cake and then right at the end we give the cake to these pharmaceutical corporations and then we say and legally you're the only one who can ever sell that cake and you can sell it to me for whatever you want uh and then they turn around and they're like how much can you afford and i'm like well what what does it do and they're like oh well it saves your life or the life of your family uh what are you willing to pay for your life or the life of your children uh and obviously the answer to that is everything and then everything i can borrow uh and that's what pharmaceutical corporations will charge that's what the market will bear means to a sociopath to a sociopath like those people running the corporations what what the market will bear means is a price that's high enough so that some people will die because they can't afford it. So that everyone else is terrified enough that they'll pay whatever, they'll do whatever it takes to pay that price. That's and, the system we're fighting against. And when even that become, and again, we're talking with Alex Lawson of Social Security Works, when even that becomes too much for people to bear, they do this little sleight of hand, which is why I think the Medicare uh, the Trump $200 card is instructive. They'll say, oh, well, you don't mm -hmm. have to pay it. You, Medicare will pay it. Your health plan will pay it. But as a society, that means we keep paying it. And I also wanted to mention that, you know, you use the word monopolies. A lot of people think of a monopoly as by Amazon or whomever, and that is a monopoly. But, the, but a patent monopoly is where like to use your analogy, we bake the cake and the, I bake the cake, I give you the monopoly on the cake, meaning nobody can sell it but you, even though I baked it, and you're selling it back to me at the cost of everything I own. So that's what we're up against. But Trump can change that, as you said, with the stroke of a pen, because there is a law by dole, bipartisan law for people who love bipartisanship, uh, passed in 1980. It says that if people need a drug and it's not available at a reasonable cost, and you tell me if I'm summarizing incorrectly, but then, uh, then the government has the right to take that patent exclusivity back, that monopoly back, and allow other people, other manufacturers or whomever to uh, produce it at a more affordable rate. Is that I got that right, right. Exactly. Just don't give the cake away. That's what that's right. what we can do. Just don't or, give the cake away. Uh, right. get, give or, give the recipe away. There's so many right. different options here, but don't allow a monopoly. Your your summary of the actual uh, remedy is spot on. That's exactly what um, the, any president can do with the stroke of a pen. Uh, but we can even go further than that. Um, Right. And I, as you know, we want to go further than that. Why should we have uh, why should we give the cake away at all? Right? If we right. baked it, why don't we actually figure out how to uh, bake the best cake in the world and then take that recipe and give it to everybody and be like, hey, everybody, here's how we bake the best cake in the world. And by the way, the best cake in the world is actually the covid vaccine. Um, that's what we're talking about here. The vaccine that will prevent uh, the coronavirus uh, from infecting people. Here is the molecule. This is how you produce it. Now everyone go produce it. They can then, you can even have the free market can operate right there, right? All the companies could compete. Um, they could compete with marketing. They could compete with logistics, all those different things, but they would not be able to have the ability to withhold uh, this molecule from being produced by other people. And that's what we do right now. That's what the patent monopoly system does is it, it takes most small molecules are simple. Uh, small molecules are not biologics. Vaccines are also com more complicated, but like a, a statin or something like that, um, we've seen it. We've seen 
them go generic. And all that means is a company was sitting there who could always have been producing this drug. And now they can because the patent has run out. And all of a sudden, the, the drug, which used to cost $500 a pill, boom, goes down to five cents a pill. We never have to let it start at $500 a pill. We could just have it start at five cents a pill. Their whole lie is based on the fact that they're the chef, that they are the, the artiste who bakes the cake. And you can't take the artiste out. They're not the artiste. They are not the scientists. The pharmaceutical corporations are not staffed by scientists in white coats. They're staffed by private equity bros in $6,000 suits who look at not ripping people off as an undervalued asset. They, they look at pills that are not priced high enough that they'll kill some people as a missed opportunity. Those are the sociopaths that are involved in this industry that Donald Trump will not challenge. And in fact, he puts them in charge of things. See, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to put this the right way, but let me, let me just say what I've got to say, which is, as you know, Alex, I, uh, I have strong ideas about pharma including my proposal that if people, as has been proven over and over again, uh, as drug executives have deliberately addicted people mm -hmm. for for-profit reasons, I think we should treat them like any other drug dealers, seize their property, make their penthouses available as rehabs for the people they addicted. I think it's that, but because it comes down to this for me, they're killing people mm -hmm. for money, as you said, and that is as immoral as anything I can imagine. When it comes to COVID, it strikes me, and, and a vaccine for COVID and, and treatments for COVID, it strikes me that at a moment of great emergency, we could probably inoculate everyone who needs to be inoculated, treat everybody that needs to be treated for less than the cost of a B-21 bomber, which is half a billion dollars. A single B be a 21 bomber right now they're planning to build what a hundred of them something like that so i guess my question is as a matter of national defense the other thing we can do it would seem to me is not only allow anyone to reproduce that molecule or those molecules but have the government manufacture it itself because it's a matter of national safety we've lost we're going to lose three hundred thousand people at least what do you think of that um i'm uh super duper on the record calling for a nationalization of the vaccine industry um, specific to so I think we can publicly manufacture small molecules big molecules in pharma uh, but I really believe fundamentally that vaccines are not at all a market good that you, that the private industry literally cannot produce a vaccine uh, in any meaningful way this is borne out by the fact that all of the money, there's a great calculator on Public Citizen's uh, website that's just counting how much money, taxpayer money, is going into the development of the COVID vaccines. It's all of it. It's all of it. A hundred percent of it is taxpayer money because it's not a market good. It is an, a public good, or I think, uh, and I, I, I'm big, if we can get this bipartisan, I don't, they can put it under the Space Force you know, build it in a, in a mountain out and put on weird fascistic uniforms and eye scanners and all the stuff that, that the defense people love. Do that. Uh, but for God's sakes, produce vaccines uh, and vaccine research to prevent the next pandemic and definitely produce vaccines and distribute them in a way that will arrest and eliminate this pandemic. It is absolutely uh, like the, the, did you say B52 or B1? B21, that's the new. B21, the B21s, what are they, who are they protecting us against right now? Are we going to bomb the virus? Because um, this virus is really kicking our asses right now. Uh, and, and those airplanes aren't doing anything. But if we have, and we actually even have an, a part of our government already, it has a great creepy logo. It's got a great acronym, BARDA. Um, and I'll get the, I'll look up the, what it stands for, because it's awesome. And uh, it, it definitely seems Bond villain enough that I think we could get Mike Lee, uh, senator from Utah, and be like, look, let's drill a hole in the mountain, put this in there, 
produce vaccines for everyone, not because we like them. We don't like the people. We want to make sure they don't think that it's a hippie um, project, but it's an issue of national security uh, because it fundamentally is. The greatest danger to the United States is we're living in, in a destabilizing pandemic, but this is actually not the big one. Uh, and H5N1 uh, pandemic influenza would be worse than this. And we and like anyone who's looking around can see that we got caught uh, not just with uh, the country's pants down, you know, uh, they're in the other room. We didn't even we're the worst performing country of all, all of our peer nations. Uh, we are absolutely unprepared. And this is not the big one. So we need to start working now to prepare uh, for the threats that we actually will face at an increasing level. It's the same as climate change, right? Like th this is just, these are not things that corporations uh, can do. So we need the government, which is us, to lean into these problems uh, and, and actually understand that privatization, the private marketplace, the miracle of the market. Um, you know why the hand is invisible, Richard? I know you know. Uh, it's because it doesn't exist. The hand does not exist. There's no magic. Uh, we need to actually look at the problems facing the people and come up with solutions together, which we can do. Uh, and when we do that, I believe that we can solve anything that's thrown at us. So, and again, we're talking with Alex Lawson of Social Security Works. So what, Alex, do you think is the state of play right now politically, whether it's in terms of activism or here in Washington, uh, where are we at in the start? Obviously, you know, the election is going to determine a lot. But let's say, assuming that Trump loses, as now seems highly likely, not inevitable, but likely, uh, what do you see as a state of play now and going forward? I think that um, the failure of the U.S. has been so complete uh, that it is is sort of remarkable. You know, it's like if 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 you are a gambling person, um, picking all the winners is super hard, right? Like if you pick ten out of ten winners on sports games, super hard. But you know what? Picking ten out of ten losers is literally just as hard as picking all the winners. That's what we did. We picked ten out of ten losers. We've done every single thing wrong. So we have a moment um, for very not quiet, um, very chaotic reflection, uh, but it is an opportunity for, because from great challenges, from global challenges, the magnitude of which, you know, my generation has never seen anything like this, except for climate change, which is continuing in the, in the background right now. Uh, but with the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing, I do believe there is appetite for responses for remedies that match that magnitude. I think that there is a willingness of people to, to think big right now. Uh, and, you know, there's definitely people who are like, oh, well, let's just return to normal. But I think they'll realize pretty soon that that's impossible, that there is no going back. There is no normal anymore. There is only what we will build together from this point going forward. Uh, and the choice is really clear, as they used to say, uh, it's either barbarism or socialism, or we're gonna do this together, right? It's either we're gonna let everyone die, but Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are gonna like fly to, to Mars. Although that's a big lie. That was just actually to produce missiles for the Pentagon. But you know, like the billionaires are gonna get everything and everyone else is gonna die, or, Everyone is going to come together and we're going to say, we pay for these drugs already. The research and development, we pay for them. We should get them. We should get them without paying, not just the highest prices in the world. There are drugs. We should get them. And in fact, not only should we get them, we should, we should direct the science so that we're not creating yet another knockoff uh, of an erectile dysfunction drug, but we're actually solving the great challenges of our time. And that's what we can do. Uh, those are the concepts, public medicines. That's what we need. We can just change the entire system.
to actually be directed by public health and not by private greed. So let me ask you this. I, I agree a million percent with everything you've said. And uh, I definitely hope that Trump will be out of office soon. But, you know, we're up against some pretty powerful forces, lobbyists and people who are going to try to obstruct. People who are going to say to leaders of both parties that, you know, the vision that you and I hold, which I think is eminently reasonable, among other things, moderate even, <laughs> that, uh, that no, you can't do that. And uh, it's true. So there's and there's a lot of money behind it. You know, two drug industry lobbyists for every member of Congress. Um, like I said before, I think one works a day shift, one works a night shift. I'm not <laughs> sure. But the uh, how do we push back against that? So I do you think that there's one big thing um, and not to get um, too uh, me metaphorical here, because I mean it really, really straightforwardly. Um, it's solidarity that's actually going to overcome the $6,000 suits, the lobbyists, the money, um, the corrupt political system that we're in. Um, you know, I'm not looking for leadership from politicians, from any politicians. Um, what is going to really change the things right now is that the globe is getting crushed by this pandemic. It's not just the United States. It's not just our political system. And there are countries already coming together that are saying there should be no monopolies. There should be no patents. We should share all of the data uh, about all of the work that we're doing. Imagine how stupid it is that there are all these different vaccines um, and all of the data is held in secret. We pay for it, but we're not even allowed to see the data right now. Like that's really dumb. Uh, and so there are countries and more and more are signing up um, through multilaterals. Uh, and also importantly, uh, there are big countries that are just stating for the record that they will not um, actually care about the patent rules when it comes to COVID and their citizens. And some of the countries that are really important in that are Brazil, South Africa, and India, because those are the three countries that basically changed um, the trajectory of HIV pharmaceuticals, of antiretrovirals. Um, Brazil is not in on it yet this time because we have, you know, Bolsonaro there. But you have India, who actually can produce any molecule. They, can, they are the heart of the generics. Uh, and South Africa have already said that they will um, actually produce a treatment or vaccines without regard to the patents uh, when it comes uh, to COVID. Just that alone, that's a huge thing, right? Like if they do that, and then all the countries middle-income, low-income countries, poor countries come together and are like, yeah, yeah, we don't care about these U.S. corporations making billions. We want to protect our people. Um, that dynamic is something that we're going to work with. Um, we're going to make the system here, like, realize the moral choice that they have. They can either, we can either lead or we will be known forever as the ones who fought against stopping the pandemic. Um, and I think that that is something that we can use the power of that, the power of the myth that people want to believe about ourselves. That's what we have that we can use against the lobbyists and their $6,000 suits. It was a little ironic a few weeks ago, Alex Lawson, when story came out that we think foreign governments are trying to hack our vaccine research. It's like, God forbid they might save some lives with that. You know, it, 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 it's insanity. And we are the sort of, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but we're kind of like the global supervillains in this story right now because of Big Pharma, not because we're not legit, you know, kind of people or don't want solidarity. We do want, so I believe it's a basic human instinct to want solidarity, to want community, to want want to do good for others uh, nationally and internationally. I think people have been deceived and I think that our leaders have been corrupted. So, so I agree with your message on 
on solidarity and on leading instead of obstructing a hundred percent. So we'll see what happens, but in close, you got any closing thoughts for us either about what people can do or what people should be looking for or anything else you want to say? Yeah, just a, a little informative because I know your audience are, are into this, um, but you can go to publicmedicines.org and you can see a manifesto that we put up. Uh, I'm one of four, four authors on it. It's a, it's a, uh, I'm one of four lead authors, and then there's just hundreds of signatories on it, including people who are way bigger than me, um, way smarter than me, saying that actually public pharma is the only system uh, going forward. And we need to be able to take monopolies away. We need to be able to manufacture um, drugs on uh, publicly. We need to be able to uh, nationalize the vaccine industry, and we need all data to be open uh, so that we can bring the totality of human genius to bear against these challenges. Uh, so that's publicmedicines.org. That's fantastic. I'm all for it. I'm going to check it out myself. And as always, Alex Lawson, Executive Director of Social Security Works, thanks for your great act. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks, Richard. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and this is the Zero Hour.